All righty, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 6 of Behind the Lines. Uh, my name is Francis O'Rourke, and joining me is a great group of people, which we'll go over in just a second. Um, but here at Behind the Lines, we bring the experts to you. Um, and today we've got a great group of experts talking about the 2018 control system and what's changed. So to introduce everybody now, uh, I'm joined by my co-host, Ruth Toomey. Hi. As well as some other folks. We've got Greg. He's from uh, a National Instruments. We've got Brad and Peter. They're both with WPI Live. And we've also got Omar here, and Omar is with Cross Road Electronics. We're going to get to each of these guys, and they're going to give their spiel about uh, what's changed with their part of the control system in just a moment. Uh, but first, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Behind the Lines. Ruth, take it away. Uh, sure, Behind the Lines is a show where we bring the experts to you. Uh, one thing to note for tonight, uh, the views expressed by Behind the Lines hosts and guests are those of the individual and don't necessarily reflect the views of first or first participants. We're doing this show because of the recent changes and we want to make sure that you have the latest and greatest news on these updates. Absolutely. All right. Don't forget that the uh, reason we bring these guys here live is because we want to hear from you guys in the chat. So if you have questions for the crew, go ahead and submit them into the Twitch chat or the YouTube chat. Type exclamation point Q and then your question to chat. We'll pull it in and then after everybody's presented in about 30 minutes or so, we'll pick the questions that we think are the best and we'll have them answer them live on the air. Um, so, uh, so Ruth, you want to finish, take us away or? Uh, sure. Let's start off with talking about FRC 2018 LabVIEW features. All right, Greg, that's your bit. Okay. Thank you. Um, the primary changes that, uh, we'd find in LabVIEW for, for 2018 are going to be simulation. We've added two additional scenes uh, that the uh, robot components and field setup, uh, as we'll see in a couple seconds in some screenshots. Uh, there's a ball shooter with both high and low targets, vision targets, um, floor pickup, active intake, um, and uh, includes some scoring and ball return and things like that. It's pretty fun. Uh, and it's a great way for uh, practicing both autonomous and even tweaking your robot for teleop efficiency. We have a second one that is uh, a maze with feedback and ultrasonic and things like that with a uh, mechanism drive. So that's a pretty good one also for uh, trying to write autonomous that can make it through the, the, through the maze the quickest. Um, and of course, these robots have, uh, they have the, the drives like you would expect. They have additional sensors, motors, servers, and things like that to make it interesting uh, for training. Uh, we've made some additional changes to command and control, uh, which is our more uh, programming framework. Uh, specifically, we've improved some of the things you can do with tracing. There's some graphing tools, some additional timestamps and features. Uh, so if you do have a lot of messages going out to subsystems, uh, you can better understand what might be going on if something doesn't make sense. Um, in addition, we have uh, on the front panel of each controller uh, for a subsystem, you have the ability to and parameters and uh, invoke a command uh, interactively. So you don't necessarily have to involve dashboards and code changes and everything like that. It's a lot quicker for, lot quicker for debugging. Um, switch slides. The uh, default dashboard and LabVIEW dashboard um, framework uh, have some fixes that uh, for some timing issues that we discovered uh, last year having to do with multiple camera supports and support on, of cameras on the field. Uh, while we were at it, we added support for up to four cameras uh, for record and playback. And so this is a feature that lets you record uh, all the network table variables, all the messages, all of the diagnostics and stuff like that uh, synchronized with the camera stream so you can play it back after the match. Uh, and later in the season, we will also have some uh, diagnostic uh, utilities for pulling data back out and graphing and putting things in tables if you want to do analysis of what was going on with some sensors or some actuators during a, a match. Um, and then we're going to get to the rest of the WPI lab changes, so I won't uh, take that away from them. Uh, but all of those, I believe, that they're talking about are also present in the, in the LabVIEW libraries. So switching slides, we'll just show some of the screenshots. This is the maze with the robot sort of parked at uh, you know, the starting position. Next slide. 
So this is actually the dashboard showing what the maze looks like from your uh, simulated camera that's on that robot. You can definitely see its mechanism wheels. Uh, next. This is the ball shooter uh, loaded up with some balls. You notice it has a uh, uh, active intake there on the front, the, uh, the yellow, and it has a blue uh, shooter that uh, uh, go to the next screen that is shooting at the wall. Uh, has some red and yellow segments there, so you can decide what your vision target is and decide what your level of challenge is. So finally, we've got, um, let me cover real quick some of the modifications we're also making to the driver's standard and some of the other tools uh, that, are, that, are, that are part of the control system. Uh, specifically on the diagnostics tab, we've got uh, some network uh, LEDs, you know, for ping and things like that. Well, we have added some additional fields and information about the Wi-Fi settings, Ethernet settings, uh, USB interface settings on your laptop. Uh, so this will help more quickly figure out if you have uh, the correct subnet uh, mask set, whether you have um, uh, DHCP or static IPs. And for the firewall, it'll help us determine more quickly uh, what portions of your firewall are on or may have been turned off. So the driver station setup tab actually has a place to enter in your game data. So this is how a, uh, the programmers can practice uh, the autos with varying inputs that would, simulated inputs that would come back from the FMS. And finally, the log file viewer um, has some additional, has, has been reworked to have some additional information about matches. So you can tell match times, match types, uh, before you click on them, you can, um, uh, deal with much larger match, much larger, much larger log files and larger directories of large files. Um, finally, we added some energy diagnostics, uh, so you can tell how much energy has been used by your PDP total and for each of the circuits on your PDP. I believe that's my last slide. All right, awesome. Thanks, Greg. And uh, just to be, just to make sure, that's that's the, your team in the background, right? You guys are meeting right now. I'm. I uh, see. So yeah, sorry about that. I'm at the uh, meeting, and uh, they just broke and uh, came out, and I'm surrounded by kids now. Oh, cool. That's awesome. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for taking time out of your meeting to come here and talk to everybody about this. My uh, pleasure. No problem. All right. So next up, we're gonna have uh, Brad and Peter uh, talk about WPI Live. But before we get started, Brad and Peter. Why don't you each uh, explain a little bit about what you do with WPI Live? Okay, so I'm um, uh, this is Brad, and I'm I, I work at WPI and um, and have been involved in the WPI Live uh, C++ and Java uh, libraries since the C Rio, so since I think 2009, I guess, and um, and have been working on it ever since. And and then and then uh, uh, more recently, over the last two or three years. Uh, a bunch of other people have joined in. The, the whole thing went open source. Some people got involved. Some other uh, mentors for Teams, and um, and and so some of them are making uh, you know very very significant changes and doing lots of work on the project. And one of them is uh, Peter. And uh, Peter, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Peter Johnson. I'm uh, uh, got involved with first as a mentor back in 2007 uh, timeframe and on Team 294 here in uh, Los Angeles area. And really, my background is all in computer engineering. Um, that's what I do as my day job. Uh, and got involved with control system actually back in the C Rio beta test days, and then moved on from that and was involved as an alpha tester on the Robo Rio. Uh, and uh, really, in the last few years, got much more involved with the control system side of things. And I developed the uh, net, kind of rewrote network tables uh, a couple of years ago and did the rewrite of camera server last year. Um, so uh, certainly a lot, of, a lot of the tools that teams are using um, in terms of some of the underlying uh, on both C++ and Java uh, in terms of both networks and camera uh, type back applications. So that's, that's, what I, I, that's my main contribution to WPI Lab. Very cool. All right, Brad and Peter, why don't you take it away? Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, we've, made, we've made a whole bunch of changes to the libraries this year uh, and added some uh, new utilities. And so we'll talk about that stuff. Uh, in general, the things we're talking about are text-based language changes, uh, C++ and Java. Although um, the the some of the tools can be used, you know, with LabVIEW also. So the first thing that we'll talk about is some of the new drive-based classes. 
So in the past, there was a, a class called Robot Drive. And generally what you did was you, you created the class, uh, put in some motors, and then you can control things with joysticks or, or uh, uh, with numeric values, you know, computed values, and get the robot to drive around. Uh, what we've done this year is refactored that into uh, three different classes, one for differential drive, uh, one for kilo drive, and one for mechanism drive. So, so just like you used robot drive before, now you choose the one for the type of drive line that you have, and then there are more specific methods and the constructors are more specific for the type of drive line that you're using. Um, robot drive, now, the robot drive is still there, but if you try to use it, you'll find that it's deprecated and you'll see messages when you try and use it in Eclipse, when you compile the program that say that the, that the class is deprecated. And what that means, because you may see that in other places also, is that uh, it's supported uh, at least this year, but deprecated means that we kind of reserve the right to take it out at some point and stop supporting it. So the preferential way of doing this stuff is to use the non-deprecated versions of the classes, and in this case, uh, differential drive, kilo drive, and, and mechanism drive, um, although robot drive is still there for compatibility, and the same will be true for other classes as we as we move on, or we've made improved uh, interfaces to it. Uh, okay, next next slide, I guess. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so we've also um, we've also changed the added another base class. So you know, in the past we've had uh, something called sample robot. It used to be called uh, simple robot. Uh, it got changed to sample robot because you're trying to get people to discourage people from using it. Uh, and then we had iterative robot. And um, uh, so, so let me just say before I, and then, and now we've added timed robot. But before I talk about timed robot, let me just uh, back up a little bit for a second. Uh, the idea for sample robot is that you can use it for making, like the name says, you can use it for making sample programs. Our intent is not that you use it for making um, large robot programs because what happens is you'll start you'll start filling out your program, you'll get yourself backed into a corner, and then it gets very hard to extend it and very hard to debug it. So the preferred method is to use either the iterative robot template or the uh, timed robot or the timed robot base class or the iterative robot base class. Um, the difference is for iterative robot, what happens is that each iteration or each time it calls one of the uh, um, one of the periodic methods in the class, uh, it does it with uh, with with uh, with uh, iterative robot. It's doing it when packets come in from the driver station, so roughly every 20 milliseconds. And um, but the problem is the timing wasn't really consistent because there's a lot of things that might uh, kind of change, add a little bit of jitter or change the timing. And people who are counting on that 20 millisecond timing were finding that their algorithms weren't working the way that they'd hoped. So we added another class called timed robot. Uh, as a base, and that actually does do more consistent timing, um, and and I think I think you'll find that that's better if you do if you're really counting on that time, and you can set the time. Uh, there's a method to set what that period is uh, uh, for each iteration, so you don't have to. Um, uh, so so it can be something other than 20 milliseconds. Uh, now it won't necessarily line up exactly with uh, packets arriving from the driver station, but. Uh, you'll always when you when you request joystick data, you'll always get the most recent uh, joystick values that have come in. Okay, uh, next. Uh, oh, this is actually this is actually really cool. Uh, in the past, we were never able to get a license from uh, Oracle to be able to include the uh, Oracle Java runtime uh, as part of our tools. Um, we've now switched to the. Um, uh, the, the Zulu JRE, this is the OpenJDK package from Azul Systems. And the really nice thing about this is that uh, when you, when you uh, um, re-image your robot, you don't have to put Java on it explicitly, but the first time you download a program, uh, the, the uh, plugin will install the JRE, uh, and then it won't do it again after that. So uh, that's pretty nice. And, and it's just so it's all built in. All I got to do is just run a Java program, and if it's not there, it will put it there. And uh, we found that the performance is uh, is is about, as far as we can tell about the same as the uh, is the official Oracle stuff. It's re they're really both built from the same source code. One of them is a is an open source thing, and one is more supported by Oracle. Uh, so that's so that's how that works, and and so that should save everybody a lot of time and uh, headaches. Okay, go, okay. Uh, here, what? So this is this is something that Peter did that's like really amazing. So Peter, you should talk about this. 
Sure. So, um, so one of the things we did this year, I, I was kind of irritated by how long it was taking to download robot programs. Um, so we dramatically sped that up this year. Um, you know, now as as was previously mentioned, it takes about a minute or so the first time you uh, you deploy because it needs to copy the JRE to it to the robot and extract it and install it. Um, but after that, um, if you're doing say a Java program, it, it typical deploys are on the order of one to two seconds. Um, it it really doesn't take very long. Um, um, the main main thing we did is we switched from a bunch of separate SSH sessions to uh, using uh, something called WebDAV, which is a, a an HTTP thing that goes to the RoboRio web server to copy the files over, and that's primarily how we did the speed up. Um, but uh, you'll, it's one of the things where where it goes from noticeably to a noticeable delay to pretty much instantaneous. Um, and uh, the reboot time, you know, by the time you get the reboot time and stuff, your your code is up and running in in just uh, you know three or four seconds. Can oh, I say yeah, as a, yeah, yeah. Can I say as a non-programming mentor? That that sounds pretty dope to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We we figure that teams often deploy code, so this is something that uh, in aggregate will save teams lots and lots of time. So absolutely, it was well you know, worth doing. So probably makes it faster when people are downloading new code and uh, queuing for yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which we hope teams aren't doing, but we understand does happen from time to time. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So um, I'll talk a little bit about network tables as well. So uh, one of the things I did this year um, that uh, team, teams have been noticing for the past you know past couple of years, particularly as we started using network tables more and more, that uh, that kind of there was this weird phenomenon where you'd have ghost values uh, or zombie values. You update your robot program and the uh, and you know the, you didn't restart the dashboard, and when the dashboard reconnects. You know, there's values which are no longer updating on the robot side, but are still showing in your dashboard. So it's a, and they end up actually showing, and then depending on what clients you have attached, that sort of thing, those values never really go away, or you basically had to shut down the entire network of network tables. So every network tables client, as well as the server, you had to shut down and restart in order to get rid of those values. So, so what we did is um, both Greg and I. Uh, worked on this, and we uh, we changed how network tables synchronizes values on a reconnect um, to get rid of this problem. So uh, basically, the approach is that um, you know only if a client changes a value is it kept around uh, when it reconnects to the server. So so otherwise, the server wins on on all of those things. So if the if the because and the reason this made sense is the robot is the server. So most of the time. You're updating your robot code. You get rid of an old value you don't care about anymore. You want that value to go away. You don't want it to keep coming back. And so, indeed, now what happens when the server reconnects is if the server doesn't have that value and the client didn't modify it, the value is deleted on the client side. So it actually disappears the way you expect it to. Uh, similarly, uh, like tie breaks between values being updated on the server and values updated on the client, if you change your autonomous mode selection, for example, on the client, you want that to stick around. So indeed, that does win. You, if you change it in your dashboard, it will uh, win over whatever value the robot side has. But otherwise, you pretty much want the robot values that are telemetry values, that sort of thing, to come through the freshest values that are on the on the robot side. So it, that's pretty much how this this operation works now. Um, and it should really dramatically improve dashboard behavior as well as so solve uh, some of the issues that teams were having with maybe their, they select, change the autonomous mode, they and then smart dashboard connects, and then their selected autonomous mode disappears um, or changes back to whatever the robot was setting it to. So those, those types of issues should be much improved this year. Um, so you can actually trust the sendable choosers um, that are on, on the dashboard side. Um, one other thing that we added, uh, uh, we we added it for C++. We haven't. Uh, there's lots and lots of different libraries for Java, and we d haven't wanted to bundle a single one yet. Um, so so there's this concept of sending structured data. Network tables only has um, a very few data types. It has numbers, booleans, strings, lists of those things, um, and just basic lists of of those. So you can't really send a a tuple of values or a list of tuples um, through the network tables standard data types. Um, so uh, what we added to C++ is we added a library which supports JSON uh, a, uh, and a couple of binary formats. One is called CBOR, 
which is a standard binary format, and then message pack, some, uh, some folks may be familiar with as well, which is another binary format. Uh, so we added a library to C++ um, that we imported from another source, so it's available from all teams. So if you want to store structured data, you can um, use that library to build a binary value, and then network tables have support for sending binary values. Um, so, so that way, if you have a coprocessor and your main processor, and you want to you know, compact a bunch of um, uh, structured data and send it over network tables, this gives you the, some of the tools that are necessary to do that. Um, the other thing that we did is we um, updated the API somewhat. Uh, there's, um, the, bi the big change here is uh, we actually support multiple simultaneous instances of network tables. Uh, so for example, if you want to have, uh, there, there's, a, there's a default instance, um, which is uh, what all the WPI web classes use and is designed to work with the dashboards. But say you want a separate instance of network tables that just talks to the coprocessor. It doesn't, you don't want it to have any of the other data in it. You just want to have the coprocessor data in it. And um, you can actually create a separate instance of network tables within either your user program or a coprocessor program so you can talk to different uh, sets of network tables at the same time. It's also useful uh, for those who are starting to explore into unit testing. It's a way where you can uh, start testing your robot code um, by creating a client instance in the same program as the robot server instance. Um, now, these new API changes did add um, some classes in a different package, uh, but as Brad mentioned earlier, uh, the old classes are still there. Um, we, we have the deprecated warnings on them, uh, so you will see warnings if you use the old classes, but they will be definitely supported for this year. Um, it's just a warning that at some point you'll, you'll want to upgrade your code, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this year. Um, the, the only other up, uh, update was made in the API is it's set up now to uh, so you can uh, get a handle, so you can get a network table entry. Uh, there's a network table entry class that maps uniquely to a given entry. And this means that the code is a little bit more performant if you cache that value. So if you store a variable with that entry, uh, the code doesn't need to do a string lookup every time you use that string. So, um, so it makes it a little bit more performant if you're really, really updating um, quite frequently in your user code. Again, it's optional to use. You can still use the old string-based methods. Those are still available. Okay, next chart. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is uh, over last summer, a couple of students at WPI um, uh, implemented a new dashboard. So we have the smart dashboard right now, and that's still there, and it still works just the way it always has. Uh, we did a newer dashboard uh, called Shuffleboard. That was kind of the internal name, and it's stuck. Uh, the difference between uh, Shuffleboard and the smart dashboard is that, well, one thing is that Shuffleboard is implemented using JavaFX, so the UI is much richer. Uh, and has bet more opportunities for making really nice looking uh, widgets on the screen. It also has record and playback. So you can you can start a recording session and you can record data as it streams from the robot and then you can stop recording and then play it back again. So that's something that's really good. So it, where, where if you see something uh, break on the robot or it doesn't behave the way you think it should, you can go back and look at the data. Uh, at the, that, that it had sent and look at it more slowly and go to a, you know, you can scrub around and move it to a point that uh, where you think it's broken, you can look at what all the sensors are doing, what the motors are doing, and, and make sure it's behaving the way you think it should. Um, there's uh, more data available to the dashboard. We'll talk about that in a little while, uh, called telemetry. Uh, we also have multiple tabs for different purposes. So you can have tabs for the developer, for competition, um, for a live window, things like that. And you can filter on entries that populate the tab. You'll see that some more in a minute. And uh, uh, SFX uh, was an, uh, another dashboard that somebody had done a while ago. So that's still available as a download, but we're not really supporting it anymore. Uh, okay, so on the next slide, you can see a picture of Shuffleboard. And, and so the way it works is that on the left are sources, that's sources of data that the widgets use. Uh, and there's, there's two sources shown here. One of them is network tables, and the other one is the uh, camera uh, server. And, and so, you, and actually there's documentation and screen steps about all of this. So you can go to uh, wplive.screenstepslive.com and, uh, and there's, you can see this in much more detail and, and much slower than I'm talking right now. Uh, but basically, um, uh, you can see two tabs up there by default. One of them says smart dashboard and one of them says live window. And uh, that's, that's equivalent to the smart dashboard and test mode that's on the, on the uh, smart dashboard. 
And then you can see widgets there. At the bottom are the recorder controls. I, I say VCR controls, but people said nobody would know what I was talking about. And um, <laughs> you, can also, you can also group these um, uh, widgets in lists. So you can see where it says lists of tiles. That's just a bunch of things grouped uh, in a way which makes sense. And, uh, and it makes things a little bit more compact. Uh, let's see, what's next? Um, so here's tabs, uh, more specifically on the next slide. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of properties for tabs, and one of them is the title, so you can change the title of each tab, so you can have it be, uh, uh, so, so you can have the title of the thing correspond to what you want to use it for. Now, something that's really cool is that you can uh, have the tab be auto-populated. So right now, like say Smart Dashboard, auto-populates with anything that you write using Smart Dashboard dot put, you know, number or put Boolean or put string. Um, well, now you can you can pick a section of network tables, um, a prefix filter, and you can have it automatically auto-populate from anything that's written to that prefix. So each tab can have a different set of data, and you can control what goes to each tab uh, by just where you write it, what the key is that you use in network tables when you write it. And again, there's some more documentation about how that works. You can also change the, uh, the uh, grid size, um, so you can have more or less resolution. You can choose to show that grid. So you can see in the pictures, there's that grid behind there. You can uh, use that when you're laying it out and then you can turn it off if you want. And you can change the horizontal and vertical spacing, which is if you've done UI programming, that's like the H gap and V gap. It's the, it's the uh, space around the uh, widgets, the data in the widgets. Okay, next slide um, is uh, show, giving you an idea of what some of the stuff looks like. This is, this is test mode. And, uh, and so you can see these are, uh, this is this a lot. Some people don't know that this it works this way. But say you use Robot Builder, or if you use some uh, some of the methods which are provided with subsystems uh, and commands, you see uh, you'll see a a grouping of all the motors and uh, sensors which are in each subsystem. So you can see that here. There's um, there's a drive based subsystem and a wrist and a gripper and I can't read what it says. It's too small on my screen. Uh, an elevator. And, uh, and so you can see different subsystems. So in the case, and some of these are pretty rich. So in the case of the um, drive base, you can actually um, do the move the two sliders and that will change the speed of the left or right side of, uh, of this differential drive. And that little X in the middle will change to an arrow to tell you which way the robot's gonna go and how much. So, you know, it's a little, it, it bends in an arc that changes as you move the sliders. So that's pretty cool. Um, and on the other ones, you can see there's a couple of PID subsystems for the wrist and the elevator. And so you can actually tune your PID loop right there uh, if you write this to the dashboard. And this works with Shuffleboard or the Smart Dashboard. Uh, you, can, you can change the PI and D values and the app for feed forward if you're doing a velocity uh, PID loop. And, um, and then you can put in a set point and enable it and you'll see the mechanism move. And you can try and get it to be, um, you can get it to move at the at the right speed and have the right performance uh, that you're hoping for um, by and, and tune it. Then you can just take those values and stick them back into your uh, robot program. So that's pretty cool. So that's a really good use of uh, of test mode um, with uh, with shuffleboard or the smart dashboard. Uh, okay, let's see what's next. Oh, yeah, and of course, no modern user interface uh, would. Would would uh, not be it would it would not be the same without having themes and so of course we have the light mode and dark mode, uh, which a lot of people prefer, and and in fact you can add your own themes and in fact actually uh, shuffleboard is very extensible and you can add your own widgets you can add your own themes, uh, the way to get more information about this is to uh, look at the uh, GitHub webpage for this all of these tools and all the stuff that we're talking about is in a group on GitHub called WPI Live Suite. And underneath there, you can find Shuffleboard. And on the wiki for Shuffleboard, there's a bunch of documentation about how you can um, uh, add themes and add widgets to, to the user interface so you can add your own things to it. So you can have things which are very rich, like the, like the drive base that we had before. So, um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, and, and, and it's got a lot of opportunity. We're also uh, doing a bunch of development on it even now. And so if you, see th if you have comments about it, be sure to tell us, like put in issues, uh, into the GitHub page uh, for, or into the GitHub repository for Shuffleboard. Um, or if you have suggestions, put those in as issues and, and we'll, we'll, we're working pretty hard to even extend it as we speak. So uh, that's, that's being done uh, right now by uh, uh, Sam Carlberg um, 
and you're doing a really great job. Okay, so the next thing uh, is telemetry. Peter, why don't you talk about that? Sure, yeah, because we added so much on uh, so much new features to Shuffleboard to automatically show these things, um, we also thought it'd be very valuable if stuff automatically showed up there. So um, we actually enabled uh, continuous telemetry of both motor and sensor values. Uh, and automatically populate that in network tables. So, um, and this is, so basically if you create a motor class um, or create a, another WPI live class in your code, it will automatically get added to network tables and data from that sensor or from that motor will be updated on every loop of iterative and timed robot classes in network tables. Um, now, if you don't want this, of course, we understand the teams may not want this to be occurring. And so you can uh, disable this uh, using the live window, disable either all telemetry, or you can just dis disable individual classes of telemetry as well. So, um, but we, we really recommend most teams leave this enabled. It really doesn't use that much bandwidth and is very, very valuable um, in your dashboard to be able to replay that data later. Um, and this means that because we're publishing it all the time and Shuffleboard, for example, um, as well as the, the LabVIEW dashboard save network tables values, um, even if you don't have it showing on your dashboard, you can add a widget later and during playback and it will show that value even if you didn't have the widget on the, on the dashboard originally. Um, so we made a few API changes again. The, 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 old, the old APIs are still there. Um, the add sensor, add actuator um, in live window are still there. Uh, we deprecated those in favor of having an add child so you don't have to repeat the subsystem name. Um, but you can still use old values. Um, I think uh, one, one thing somebody mentioned on Chief Delphi was that, hey, uh, uh, the robot builder still uses the old methods. Um, that's fine. Again, uh, it's just going to uh, put some warnings when you compile your code. But uh, but we added this again to to really enable teams to um, be able to debug stuff more easily. Um, so next chart uh, is uh, Outline Viewer, and I'll hand it back to Brad. Okay, this is uh, this is another uh, new version of an old tool, um, uh, Outline Viewer. This is actually really good if you want to see what's going on in network tables. Uh, this is sort of like a debugger for for network tables. So you can pop this up on the screen and you can see everything that is in network tables at any time. And so a lot of times people use network tables with um, with grip, uh, say for doing uh, uh, vision programs or they have coprocessors like a Raspberry Pi or something on their robot and, you, and they're communicating via the network tables implementation and you wanna know what's going on. So you can pop up the outline viewer and, um, and it will show you uh, what's happening. And all you have to do is put in a team number or a uh, uh, for the, and it will it will figure out what where the server is to connect to it, or you can put in you know non-standard port numbers, or you can put in IP addresses, and and you can see what's happening. And then you can uh, change values, or and there's checkboxes for Boolean values, so you can edit stuff. You can see arrays, uh, you know, so you can basically see everything and kind of debug what's going on um, uh, with your network tables part of your program. Okay, and the last thing is. Uh, uh, the Eclipse, uh, pl I think it's the end of it. Uh, the last, yeah, it's the Eclipse plugins. Um, so again, it's much faster to deploy. This is something which uh, the, we think you guys are really, really going to like. Um, there's improved uh, image version detection for the Robo Rio. Um, and uh, and it automatic, like we said before, it automatically deploys the, uh, deploys the uh, Java runtime system if it's not there. And... Um, Oh, and there's a new TCP-based console plugin. So the console messages you see streaming by um, are it's it's a new version of that, which which we hope will be more reliable and uh, and otherwise it should work pretty much the same way that the uh, the old version worked. Yeah, the 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 new uh, real log um, uh, does use a fixed point font, which I know some people prefer. Um, actually, it's it's also color coded. Um, all of the uh, settings for that are available in the preferences of Eclipse. Um, the one caveat with the new real log is. Uh, you need to uh, be connected to the robot with a driver station, not necessarily the same computer you're developing on, but um, a driver station needs to be connected to the robot in order to uh, get that output, that, that real log console output. So uh, I just want to mention one thing for you guys. Uh, we, if you have old laptops from, pre, you know, say from last year, from 2017, and you want to use the 2018 stuff, you have to get the new plugins and install them. So you have to upgrade the plugins from last year's plugins to this year's plugins. And then the other thing, um, that you want to be careful about is if you're writing C programs, you have to get the new tool chains, um, and so we've updated those as well. And uh, and again, all this, all those tools like Eclipse and the and the compilers and and all the stuff we just talked about all runs on Linux and Linux Macs or um, uh, or Windows. 
So just make sure you get the, the correct tool chain so you'll have the, the cross compilers for uh, building RoboRio programs. Uh, and, and then you should be good to go. Cool. All right. Well, hey, Peter and Brad, thank you very much for talking about all that stuff. It's, it's great to hear from you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Awesome. <laughs> all right. So uh, last but not least, we're going to bring up Omar. Omar's with Crossword Electronics. Uh, Omar, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm Omar from Crossroad Electronics. Uh, I'm um, one of two owners of the company that makes the PDP, PCM, VRM, and collaborated with uh, VEX to produce the Victor SPX and the Talon SRX. Um, and I think it'd be good to discuss the new installer for this season, the uh, Phoenix Framework Installer, which is our uh, latest version of our tool suite, what used to be called the CTRE tool suite last year. Um, one of the um, one of the things I'd like to address is, is how to go about finding the documentation for updating your control system from 2017 to 2018. Um, there's some screenshots here of our website, just how to basically navigate it. Um, there are several ways to get to the Phoenix installer for this year. Um, but a lot of teams, if you're one of the teams that goes to our website, as opposed to uh, Andy Mark Bex or the FRC um, Screen Steps documentation, uh, you can find it on our site under the Talon SRX product page. You'll see uh, an orange uh, link there uh, citing that the API has changed. Um, if we follow that through to the next page, um, under tech resources of the Talon SRX, we see some documentation citing first uh, FRC Power Up and basically some links to the same uh, documentation, which we moved to GitHub this year for a variety of reasons. Uh, if we follow that through to the next page, um, uh, next, <laughs> next page, please. Um, we get to our Hero Development Board page, which is the control system that we sell with comparable API. Uh, we, congl we conglomerate our uh, device libraries into one package. Uh, that way, it makes our test plan simpler, easier, um, and we can just better support our customers, both FRC and non-FRC. Um, here, you'll see the same sort of document documentation links, uh, an orange reminder that there's a migration guide covering the new API, and most importantly, a link to download uh, the actual installer. The zip link is uh, highlighted in pink, but I, it's also worth pointing out that we provide the library two ways either with a uh, Windows installer that you just natively run and it puts your binaries where they need to be, or a zip that contains uh, binaries themselves. So if you're not using Windows or you would just prefer to do the installation yourself, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we have, see if you click on the Phoenix document link. This is a screenshot of the first page that I grabbed uh, off of. This is basically an email uh, that we continuously update and maintain based on the feedback of our app. You can see a table of contents. Well, one of the things that we, the feedback that we got from previous seasons is that the talent software reference manual, though detailed and verbose, the order of the subjects didn't quite follow the, the natural flow of a team that picks up a talent for the first time and configures it, plays with the open loop features, uh, hooks up a sensor, closed loop, motion profile, profile, motion magic, et cetera. So we designed this documentation. It's sort of a, 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 water, a, a waterfall flow where you start at the beginning, learn how to install the installer, uh, install the web dash, field upgrade, confirm your hardware works, throttle up, pick your directions, sensors, and then all the way into the advanced features. Uh, you can go ahead on the, hit the next page. Uh, quick synopsis about what's new with the kickoff release of the Phoenix installer. Uh, we enhanced the current limiting features of the Talon SRX that was uh, requested by a number of mentors uh, who had contacted us directly. Uh, in the previous year, we added a feature where, I think it was was the previous season, we added a feature where you can specify a hard limit. So if you don't want your drivetrain talents to exceed 20 or 30 amps, you can specify that limit 
and now, now ensure that when your student drives your robot into an immovable object, it doesn't stall out or produce a, a stall event that would kill your battery, uh, introduce brownout. Um, there's a variety of reasons to use um, the current limiting, but it would be nice if the current limiting features allowed you to uh, provide a large amount of current for a fixed period of time and then servo back down to the continuous limit. Uh, we thought that was important for a variety of reasons, uh, including the introduction and increasing use of the 775 Pro motor. Um, but this strategy is helpful for any motor, any mechanical system. Um, so I'm excited to see how many teams will leverage the new uh, peak threshold for current limiting. Uh, next is support for the new Victor SPX. That's yet another new cross the road and uh, VEX motor controller. Basically, it's a canified version of the Victor SP. Uh, it's available for purchase now at VEXPro.com and will be available at uh, our website, ctr-electronics.com and uh, AndyMark. Um, but we're, we've supported that new device and a new, another new device called Canifier, which is a sort of general purpose uh, device that supports LED, uh, common anode LED outputs, uh, PWM inputs, PWM outputs, GPIO quadrature. Basically, it's meant to take a subsystem that's not on CAN and canify it. And once it's on the CAN bus, then we can leverage some direct interactions between Victor SPX and Canifier and Talon SRX and Canifier. Uh, Talon SRX and Victor SP, the dead bands have the ability to be changed now from the default 4%. Um, uh, that was another feature that was requested by several um, students and mentors. Um, Skipping along, we made some API changes this year to accommodate some more advanced closed loop features like a cascaded PID and integrated integration of the Pigeon closed loop servo directly into the Talon SRX firmware. Although the firmware that supports it isn't available for, wasn't available for kickoff, uh, we had to get the API changes in, um, which we had accomplished. As a consequence of that though, the motion profiling features in general was disabled in the kickoff release. Um, but fortunately, we'll be releasing later this week, most likely Friday, with uh, the next version of Phoenix that does support uh, restored motion profiling. So the teams that were uh, relying on that feature will be able to use it once again. Um, in addition, we increased the number of closed loop slots in the Talon SRX and therefore the Victor SPX. It used to be two. And you'd be able to see them in the web dash in seasons past, and you can still do that. But there's a third and fourth um, closed loop slot so that if you're doing aggressive gain scheduling, um, you have more slots to choose from. Uh, and part, part of the changes involved there also freed up some memory. So in future, we'll be able to incorporate even more things into the, the closed loop slot, like perhaps automatic gain scheduling and um, advanced features that yet to be implemented. Although one of the features we did add this year that was asked for uh, many times was the ability to cap the integral I accumulator. We always had the ability to auto clear it using the I zone, but we never had uh, the ability to cap it. So that's been incorporated as well. Um, robot board, uh, builder supported for all the devices. Um, obviously support for all three languages. We also added, and this is important, because of the number of configurable parameters in the Talon SRX and Victor SPX, which are all persistent, we added the ability to factory default them using the same method you would with PWM. So if you press and hold the BC Cal button and power boot your Talon or Victor, all of your config parameters will default to zero. This is important because due to the number of persistent configs, it's no longer practical to call every single config parameter to make sure that your motor controller is configured exactly how you want it. It's far more simpler to just default the, if you do a talent replacement, for example, or move your um, move your motor controllers around in your bench, in your lab, or on your robot, or from one robot to another, you have the ability to quickly restore all of the persistent features. And that, that's something that's also gonna help um, teams take advantage of the advanced features, but not get bit by uh, leveraging something under the hood that wasn't obvious when you move the town to another robot. Um, there's 
also a detail here about uh, set invert that we'll get into in a moment. But basically, uh, we never really liked the way that set invert and set reverse functions worked on the Talon SRX. There was like half a dozen reverse functions, and it wasn't clear when to use one versus another depending on what mode you're using. So we've normalized all of it. There are now two functions and only one that has to do with the sensor, which we'll go over in a few minutes. Um, I think that fairly covers this page. Now, in the same document, it's it's very important that you follow the steps in order. Um, because of the complexity of the FRC control system, there's a lot of gotchas. So the first thing you should do before you write any software, if you're using a Talon SRX, Victor SPX, Canify, or Pigeon, is to install Phoenix. Uh, the download is uh, where I had showed you on our website prior. Um, and I think there might be a link to our website via the FRC screen steps. But um, regardless of what language you use, it's very important to run or install. Uh, next page. After you install the Phoenix framework, um, it, it is minimally uh, beneficial and maximally required if you're using LabVIEW to run the RoboRio upgrader. And it is a feature of a program we provide called Hero Lifeboat, which we introduced in FRC last season. The reason why it's important is because minimally it installs the web dash, which is the web interface in the RoboRio for setting your IDs, field upgrading your devices, running the self-test, uh, changing the descriptions, um, which is helpful for quickly identifying what devices for what subsystem. Um, but in addition to that, this is also what installs the shared object that is used if you're a Java or LabVIEW team. Now, if you're a LabVIEW team, Eclipse will do this for you. So there's not much of a benefit uh, beyond the web dash update or installing the web dash. Uh, and when the, when the uh, update is complete, you'll see a pop up that says robot controller is updated and a reminder if you're a LabVIEW team to um, restart and or redeploy your LabVIEW application so that it sucks up the new shared object. And now you can it also um, had you have loaded LabVIEW prior to running this step, the application you had deployed most likely will not be able to run because the shared object didn't exist in the RoboRio. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that this season, the out-of-box RoboRio image doesn't have the uh, web dash at all. Um, so if you're not seeing the CAN devices image, be sure to run this. This mo The most likely root cause is that you haven't run this step yet. Um, on the, if you follow down through the README after the installation step, uh, there'll be a reminder to test your Phoenix install. Um, uh, for posterity, we document where the LabVIEW, or I'm sorry, the library files are installed, and they're usually a subfolder inside of the WPI lib. If you're using C++ or Java, we also pad out where to find the VIs and where to find them on the palette, so you should be able to quickly determine that the installation was uh, successful. Uh, next page. So now that I've installed all the software or installed all of the requirements, I can write some software, right? Well, not really, because there's new firmware this year as well. Um, the simplest method for field upgrading your devices or identifying that you need to is to open up the web dash. The web dash once you run Lifeboat, um, will work automatically in the RoboRio. Navigate to the RoboRio web-based config via um, the MDNS name of the robot. Or uh, what we do at CTR is we just plug in USB in the RoboRio and we just type in the static IP 172.22.11.2. And that will pull up this image. Uh, over on the right, you can see what it looks like when the web dash doesn't have the web the CTR web plugin installed, you won't even see the CAN uh, hardware, the CAN node, the trunk of the tree view that normally would populate with the CAN devices. If you don't see anything that says CAN, you most likely forgot to update the or install the uh, web based config. Uh, next page. Uh, and 
uh, one final reminder, because of the way the RoboReal works, before you field upgrade your devices, you have to log in to give yourself the, the, the credentials necessary to be able to upload files. Um, a cleanly formatted RoboReo will have a password or username of admin and a blank password. Uh, so just type in admin for the username and hit enter. Um, one final note is well, one common gotcha that teams seem to miss is where the firmware files are located. If you run the Phoenix installer, they're installed right on your hard drive. Uh, we actually install in one of two places. The most convenient place to find them if you're an FRC team is to go to your users folder slash public slash documents slash FRC. And the uh, firmware extensions are CRF. That stands for cross the road firmware. Um, also displayed is the latest firmware versions at the time of writing, which is uh, 3.1 for Victor and Talon and 0 0.40 and 0 0.41 for uh, Canifier and Pigeon. Now, if you forget that step and decide to write code anyway, you'll most likely see one of two errors inside of your driver station because now the, our libraries automatically check the firmware versions behind the scenes. And if the firmware version is old, you'll get an error saying you need to update. And if it's too old, particularly from last season, then you will get a generic error saying, go to the web dash, check your ID, check your firmware. In which case, if you follow these steps, you'll be able to feel upgrade and you'll be up and running quickly. Um, the, the, probably the biggest change this year is that we had to change the API for the Talon SRX uh, and therefore the Victor SPX. Uh, they share a lot of the same functions because they're both CAM motor controllers with the same base functionality. Um, so when looking at the new API, it first helps to know where, how you can get to it. Uh, and we haven't documented several different ways uh, to help migrate to the new API. Uh, in this uh, image, uh, we cover explaining that the API source is now available on GitHub. Uh, last year, we, it was closed sourced and we had just distributed binaries. Prior to that, our C++ and Java implementations were part of WPI lib. So this year, they're back to being open source and available for customization, download, or review. Uh, we also generate HTML documentation, which we'll go over in a few minutes. Uh, for C++ and Java. So if you prefer the Oxygen or Java doc style documentation, that's readily hosted on our website and is automatically installed for you uh, in the WPI folder where we install our libraries. Um, one useful tip in using Eclipse in general is to leverage the IntelliSense. However, leveraging the IntelliSense means you have to tell Eclipse where to find the source's jar file. Um, if you continue down through our documentation, we should explain how to add the Java doc if using Java. And basically what you do is you right click select on the Phoenix jar file and navigate through the uh, Eclipse submenu and path it to the sources jar file. Uh, in our documentation, we cover it step by step. And once this is done, you can press control space bar in Eclipse and type in neutral peak voltage, battery, whatever it is that you're searching for. And we find that that helps you very quickly find what you need, knowing that the API has changed this year. Uh, on the next page, uh, we cover a, li a little bit of what I had described as far as pointing it to the sources jar file. And you can see once complete, we get full IntelliSense. You can hover over functions, uh, get the Java doc style documentation, parameter names, uh, what the calling contract is, and then at the bottom image, we can see what the IntelliSense looks like um, for all the objects inside of Phoenix. Um, remember control space bar, it's a very useful shortcut for manually pulling up the IntelliSense. Um, on the next page, we go over C++. Uh, in previous seasons, we had individual includes for different things um, to better match the Java API, the new object model now leverages namespaces, uh, just like packages in Java, and they're one-to-one -one with Java. So that should help with the confusion of where the classes are switching from one language to another. Um, but 
we recognize that in C++, the development experience isn't quite as good as Java. You don't get the, the benefits of automatic imports. You don't get um, any IntelliSense help whatsoever, generally, unless you include the header. So we produce a top-level header called Phoenix.h, which includes several of the subheaders and has using declarations for namespaces. So you don't have to worry about um, dereferencing the namespaces yourself, typing in CTRE colon colon Phoenix colon colon, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you're an advanced C++ team and you would rather not populate your global sp scope with namespaces, feel free to take this header apart and just grab what you need. Uh, but I think for the majority of teams using C++ um, who are not incorporating a bunch of libraries, who do not have a lot of conflicts with the way their classes are named against the stock libraries, um, they'll probably just benefit from including the one top level header. Once that's done, you should be able to leverage IntelliSense, uh, and that will help you find what you need as you write your robot code. And then lastly, lab, the LabVIEW palette has changed as well. Um, and again, it's it. Uh, uh, and again, it, it's it's been enhanced because for a number of reasons. Not only has the API changed, but we had to support a new motor controller and produce a type of API that allows us to possibly extend to other future devices, maybe future motor controllers. Who knows? But you can find the top level CTRE folder by navigating to the third party sub palette folder where the WPI robotics library sits. In addition to that, the CTRE sub palette is available under robot drive, motor controller, can motor, and under sensor, sensors third party, and under actuators third party. So it's in multiple spots. And once you find that, you'll be able to see four folders with pictures of our products. So we did our best to make it as easy to find as possible for all of the uh, LabVIEW VIs for all the products involved. We also document where, they, where the VIs are uh, on your hard drive as a way to uh, sanity check the installation if anyone has any problems. Um, continuing down, <clears throat> down on the docu uh, Phoenix documentation, um, only part of it is shown here where we have the procedure for defaulting the talent via the BC Cal button. In seasons past or with previous seasons firmware, that would just default the PWM Cal. But again, this year it defaults all of the configurations. So you know you can cleanly start with pristine values and all your configurable parameters. This step is part of a broader step that we, do, a, a broader group of steps that we do, document in the Phoenix documentation for how to go about general hardware testing your uh, motor controllers. Um, a lot of mistake teams make is that when they buy hardware, whether it be our motor controller, someone else's motor controller, something else entirely, is you need to unbox the device and test it the first day you get the hardware, even if you don't plan on using it on your robot, even if you intend for it to be a spare. Most companies have warranties with finite periods of time, and um, you certainly want to make sure your hardware works before you hand it to your student so that if they run into a problem, it will help you diagnose what the root cause was. Maybe the student made a mistake and fixed something wrong. You can use that as a learning opportunity to help them better understand how to integrate these complex component components into their robot. So I strongly recommend, in the case of a motor controller, unbox it, uh, default it, firmware update it, drive in both directions, make sure the LEDs work. You don't want to find out there's a problem at a competition when you need to do a replacement. You just want to have a general inventory and have all of your hardware be uh, in a, a state of readiness. Uh, next page. Um, actually, go, go back to the previous page. Yep, thank you. Um, one of the new features or the way uh, a change in how our features work is the way that we implement invert. In seasons past, we had like half a dozen reverse functions. And it was confusing. Teams were, I mean, we documented how to use it, but it wasn't enough. Teams just didn't know what was the difference between set close loop reverse versus uh, set sensor or reverse sensor versus um, set invert versus this versus that versus the other thing. So this year, we have one function called set invert, for, which is modeled after the WPI speed controller interface. If you invert the motor controller, 
that change goes all the way down into the firmware of the device, which means it applies for all control modes, all closed loops, uh, follower mode. But what's key is that when you flip the invert, the LEDs on the motor controller will not change. Instead, the output of the H bridge will change. This is important because if you're using soft limits for forward, if you're using the uh, limit switch forward, or if you're closed looping, we want to make sure that everything is still in phase, even though you chose to um, flip the output LEDs and soft or output motor leads and software. So in other words, if you decide that elevating to the top of your robot should hit your limit switch and your limit switch is wired to the forward limit switch input on the talon, that means you want the talon to turn green as the elevator goes up. Now, if the motor is wired in such a way that's not true, where you uh, provide positive green output and the elevator goes down, use this function to flip your output and now the elevator will go up continue to be green and hit your limit switch, which you wire to the forward limit. Without this feature, in seasons past, teams found themselves, themselves in situations where if they wired the wrong limit switch, there was no clear software way to solve it. They would have to flip via soldering wires, the reverse and forward limit switch, or flip uh, thresholds for the soft limits. So we wanted to simplify all of that. And that's why the set invert works the way it does now. Uh, next page. Uh, okay. Uh, the other function is the set sensor phase. Uh, in seasons past, you would have to align your sensor so that positive sensor change corresponded to positive throttle. But there were several reverse functions. Again, this year we have one function. All you have to do is find the value such that set sensor phase, pa pass the value into set sensor phase so that sensors positive with green LED or positive throttle. Once that's done, you can call set invert with whatever parameter you want and the sensor will still say, stay in phase because the motor controller is smarter now. So you can decide what's forward and what's reverse without having to worry about your sensor phase once it's set. Uh, next page. On the same repository where hold our software API documentation, we have our migration table. And the goal here is so that if you're looking for a function that doesn't exist anymore, you can simply control F, type in, or uh, control F, type in the name of the function, search, find its replacement, and then call that. Uh, this is helpful if the intelligence is not cooperating um, or you had forgotten to set up the Java doc um, to leverage the intelligence features of Eclipse. But a lot of the new contracts are um, are documented here on a line-by-line -line basis. Uh, we try to group the new APIs um, by group so that you can quickly find what you need. Uh, but again, if there's something that we missed or something that you're not understanding, you can contact us via through uh, GitHub or through our regular support email, uh, and we'll do our best to help you. Uh, uh, some more, uh, uh, this is the uh, middle of the uh, migration documentation. Uh, if we have time, maybe go over some of the, oh, <laughs> this is uh, uh, our HTML, um, our Java doc version of our documentation, which is hosted on our website. One of the new things this year is that our motor controller is inherent from a base motor controller <clears throat> called base motor controller. And it has a majority of the functions. So if you're in the talent page and you're not finding what you need, click on the base motor controller link and on the next page, you can see um, on the next page. Uh, is it, uh, there we go. Uh, base motor controller has a majority of the functions. Uh, you can see here, everything's documented. One of the new things about the API is almost an error code. One of the complaints teams had in seasons past is that um, if I call a function and the talent's not on the bus, I have no way of knowing other than the message on the driver station, but I might want to be able to programmatically uh, manage it. <clears throat> so uh, we saw that this year by adding error codes to almost every API. Uh, next page. We've also updated all of our examples. They're also on our Cross the Road Elect uh, GitHub organization, uh, and they also work out, out of the box with uh, Phoenix V5. We, do, we separated the documentation into two repositories, one for programming languages and one for LabVIEW. 
uh, we find that the language examples tend to be very similar anyway. So it's advantageous to put them in one um, repository and uh, document them with one set of documentation. And then for the lab view stuff, which tends to be um, more image centric because you're displaying snapshots of the eyes. Um, and also you need common documentation to explain how to load a lab view example, uh, particularly going into the settings, changing your team number and possibly correcting any pathing issues uh, that LabVIEW may experience because of the way the VIs are linked. Um, so this is the examples language, um, the Phoenix example language repository. I think on the next page is the LabVIEW equivalent. Um, on the next page, uh, okay. See how I sped it up. <laughs> Arnie, well, uh, Omar, thank you very much. I know there's a lot of stuff uh, that we had to cover. Um, so uh, thank you very much for going over a whole ton of stuff. Again, where can we find all this information if we want to view it like in a in a web-based form? Uh, the, there's uh, two general locations. One would be crossroadelectronics.com, say under the Talon or Victor or Hero product pages, or just go to our CTRE GitHub, which is linked on ctrelectronics.com um, and that will basically any repository that says Phoenix on it is going to be of value to you and even within our, the documentation on github there's a lot of cross links so that you can navigate through migration Phoenix doc Java and C++ uh, API etc all right very cool all right so uh, we're going to go to questions again we've got lots of questions going through so we're not going to be able to answer every single one of them uh, necessarily today but we're going to get to as many as we can. Uh, it's been a long episode already, so some of you are probably tired, so we won't spend too, too late uh, this tonight. But we're going to get started with our first question here. Uh, I think it's actually some folks have already talked about it at one point earlier today, but uh, we'll go over that anyway. Uh, all right, here we go. So our first question is going to be uh, for Crossword Electronics. This is for Omar. I think you may have mentioned this in the presentation, but when will motion profiling uh, be, be implemented and available again on the SRX for the new libraries? So uh, we've already cut the firmware for that and we're just going through our test plan, which takes a couple days. Uh, I anticipate the next release of Phoenix will be this Friday, in which case you'll have motion profile fully restored. I did have to make, I made one change um, to where originally I was planning on removing the trajectory duration point out of the trajectory structure and making it one global setting. Um, but when I had mentioned that, there were a few people that were disappointed in it because they wanted the ability to have individual durations inside of the trajectory point. So I went back and thought it through and I found a way to accomplish that. So what you'll find documented in this week's release is that you have the ability to set the base trajectory duration for all trajectory points. Um, anywhere from zero to 255 milliseconds. That's convenient if you're using the um, like the cheesy proof spliner or uh, any tra uh, trajectory generator that just has a one flat rate across all of them. And there's an additional parameter inside the trajectory point where you need to choose between uh, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100 milliseconds. The effective trajectory point is the sum of the two. So you'll still be able to have individual trajectory times that are unique to some degree or just set the base uh, um, the base trajectory point with the granularity of one millisecond anywhere from one to 255. So I think between those two uh, solutions uh, any given team will be able to accomplish whatever it is whatever type of trajectory they're trying to uh, implement. Cool already. Excellent. So our next question looks like this one is for Greg. Uh, what does Greg recommend for LabVIEW config parameters? A config profile hosted on the PC or RoboRio? This one comes from Dead Spike NA on our Twitch chat. Uh, interesting question. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that uh, I'll add to that, that, I think they both have the trade-offs. I don't know that I can specifically say one is better than the other, but another way of going about it is also to use the um, 
the persistence feature of network tables. So by opening up the dashboard and double clicking on variables, you can say that you want this to be saved on your PC and automatically loaded the next time. So the dashboard will automatically make the config file for you uh, if you have those network table variables uh, set as persistent. So that is, a, I guess that's a, a third way of doing it or a more automatic way of doing it on the PC. Cool. Alrighty, so this question is going to be uh, more toward uh, Brad, uh, Brad here. Um, this one's coming up. Uh, the question is, what kinds of features do you see coming to WPI Live in the future? I know that we're we're in the 2018 season, but do you have like a, a roadmap or what's the next step uh, in the near future? Well, we've talked about adding a lot of new features. We, we've talked about uh, enhancing shuffleboard some more. Um, we've, we've been talking about adding um, GPU support to, uh, uh, to um, uh, GRIP. Uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things. But really, uh, if you guys have things you'd like to see, be sure to let us know and put stuff into the appropriate, um, you know, add some issues, which are feature requests to the uh, correct repositories in the uh, on GitHub and WPI Live Suite, and we'll, we'll you know, consider everything. Um, so, so it's kind of early to say right now, we're just trying to get all of our stuff all, all locked down and finished for this year, and, uh, and we'll be starting to think about next year uh, pretty soon. Cool, thanks, Brad. It looks like this next question is for Omar. Uh, why is Phoenix a new library instead of adding to last year's library? Well, <laughs> there are many reasons. Um, this answer might be a little bit long, so I'll do my best to, to make it quick. Uh, prior to last season, historically, the majority of the library was incorporated with uh, WPI in the case of C++ and Java, and the um, uh, root and I install in the case of the eyes. Uh, starting last season, the uh, decision was made for motor controllers, custom motor controllers, particularly CAN motor controllers, to be pulled outside of all that. Um, so last year, for the sake of being successful and giving teams what they need, we had to figure out how to make an installer in order to deploy our binaries and make sure everything still works and, not, and, and, and still be as robust as it was in season past. Um, but that uh, had a few problems, one of which is it didn't give us the freedom to create new motor controllers. And we wanted to make the Victor SPX uh, reality. We think it made sense. Now would be a good time to make sense to have a um, $49.99 CAN motor controller that complemented the Talon SRX. It had them follow each other, uh, communicate with other nodes on the bus. Um, but that required a major change in how our library worked. Um, the, as, uh, in, in the past, our, our portion of our library had always been auto-generated, and then that would have been hand-wrapped in uh, classes that we had collaborated with with WPI Lib. But the problem with that is we, the burden of effort increased. And in order to produce a solution that we had confidence in, we had to expand the auto generation of code. And as we did this, we went through our functions na function names and determined that a great deal of our functions just didn't make sense. We had two different types of voltage compensation. We had half a, do uh, half a dozen reverse functions. We had some routines that were configs and some of them were sets, but really they were all configs because they leveraged persistent memories. We didn't have any timeout parameters. So when teams wanted to adjust the um, or change the position, terror position, home position of the sensor, there was no mechanism to wait for it to finish before they had moved on. Um, there were also a lot of functions that were just carryovers from CAN Jaguar days, uh, which is the motor controller that it, it can't even be used anymore. So combined with the fact that we had to make core changes to make Victor SPX uh, successfully supported. Uh, the fact that we had a ton of function names that confused our customers that we were legacied into. Um, and we had a lot of calling contracts that just didn't make sense. We had supported a single set, a single parameter set uh, for a few years now. But when we look at our support emails and calls, teams were confused by the fact that they would change control mode in one location and then call their set routine in another, and the set routine would have been sensor units for, for their position uh, close of targets. Then they would change the control mode way over here and then wonder why the motor controller didn't work anymore. And, and it would ask us why, and we'd have to figure out, well, because you're not doing the two things in the same place. Um, 
another consequence of the uh, or another change we had to implement is that now a common set of our functionality is implemented in shared object that now has to be deployed into the RoboRio in the case of WebView, auto deployed in the case of Java. Long term, that's going to be good for teams because it means uh, less of a likelihood for a regression bug to occur. Um, because now the APIs, the things that have to be implemented three times, three different languages, uh, is far more trivial and auto-generated to a degree. Uh, and that's a, that benefits everyone. All right, cool. Well, thanks for that explanation. Uh, we're going to go on to our next question here. This one's more uh, toward the WPI Live guys. Um, so the question is, uh, what's the purpose of the robot map class uh, that Robot Builder generates? What's uh, what's the what's the reason for that? Uh, okay, so so that's a good question. Um, what we're doing is we're we're trying to have what. So originally the idea was to have uh, in one place, one file, everything that uh, for about all of the. Uh, uh, sensors and actuators, all the pinouts and all that stuff to be in one spot, in one file. Um, we Lately, we've been talking about kind of making it more the way that you would write the program by hand, which is to kind of distribute that stuff into the classes which they're part of, which would be a better kind of object-oriented model. But that's really the, that's the purpose of it. So it's not, it's probably not the way that you would write it if you did it by hand, but it's uh, all automatically generated code, so it doesn't really matter too much. And the part that you do you can make uh, you know pretty clean, um, so it's kind of an artifact for when we when we first did it. We we will you'll probably see that change. Oh, uh, one other thing, if I can just mention it, uh, one of the things I didn't mention before about new things was that you know some of the members on the team have gone through a lot of work to to, to separate the uh, libraries, the C plus plus and Java libraries, into two parts. One of them is the low level library called the Hell, the the um, hardware abstraction layer. And then there's the, the upper part, which is the C++ and Java, you know, interface to, to programs that you write. And uh, that lets us do, uh, give us a much better handle on doing different kinds of simulation and things like that. So that's something that you might see in the future and people are kind of actively working on that right now. So a real quick question cool. before we get to a real question. Uh, is the lower level called hell for any particular reason or does it just happen to work out that way? Hell, oh, you mean, oh. Uh, like H, well, like H -E double hockey sticks, the other word? Oh, hell, H-A-L? No, no, oh, okay. no, it's not. No, actually, I think uh, uh, Microsoft also, uh, you know, calls it the hell um, for, for like, well, when it was Windows NT, I don't know what they're calling it right now. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> cool. It stands for hardware abstraction layer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hell, well, oh, like from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yes. That makes me feel less better, but. <laughs> yes. one, one less than IBM. <laughs> there we go. Um, no, next question. Uh, is the Canifer legal this year? Will motion magic be reintroduced at the same time as motion profiling? Uh, can you repeat the question? You, you broke up there for a moment. Sure. Uh, is the Canifer legal this year? Will motion magic be reintroduced at the same time as motion profiling? Is, is Canifier legal this year? Mm -hmm. Is that... Oh, I understand. Yeah. So the can the canifier supports PWM output. That is not legal for motor controller use. I think that's the intent of the question. Uh, and this the second question is: uh, Will motion magic be introduced at the same time as motion profile? Motion magic is actually is uh, was supported in the kickoff release of Phoenix. It was motion profile that we had to disable. So if your goal is to just enable motion magic set a cruise velocity and an acceleration, hook up a sensor and watch your, you know, elevator slow as it reaches its target, that sort of stuff. You should be able to do that now with the kickoff release. Um, and if you're having trouble, uh, either go through the documentation or contact us directly and we'll help you through it. Cool, all right, that's good to hear. Um, so I've got another question for you. Uh, and this one's also going to be toward Omar. Again, Omar, I think you, you probably had the most changes. So uh, we have lots of people asking questions about the, the seat crossroad stuff. Um, how do can followers work? Does the follower uh, follow the master's configuration as well as its output? Uh, that's a good question. So um, last year in previous seasons, when a talent follows another talent, it follows its, its flat output regardless of what is determining the output of the master talent. This is useful because 
the master talent could be closed looping velocity, position. It could be um, just open loop control from a joystick. This year it works the same way. What the what's changed is that you can have a victor follow a talent, a talent follow a victor, victor follow a victor, and talent follow a talent. There's a new um, uh, function for C++ Java called follow. So if you do talent.follow and pass in, say, a victor reference, it'll all just work. And for the same reasons, uh, all we do is the, the follower just looks at the uh, applied output of the master and mirrors it. Uh, the control frame or the status frame that transmits that data goes out on the bus every 10 milliseconds by default. We find that that's been adequate for uh, every mechanism that I've seen. And, uh, but if for some reason you needed to speed that up or slow it down, there's API to change the status frame rate of the master's uh, status frame that holds that information. Cool. All right. Uh, our next question, how do can followers work? Do, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, we just asked that one. Uh, final question, what happened to my can devices in the web dashboard on the Robo Rio? Uh, I'm sorry, it broke up again. One more time. <laughs> uh, what happened to my CAN devices in the web dashboard on the Robo Rio? Ah, uh, okay. So uh, as I said earlier, the stock Robo Rio image this year for the first time does not have the web-based CAN plugin, the software we provide, base installed. You have to install it yourself. So in order to do that, if you run or follow the proceed the instructions in the documentation to run Lifeboat, plug in USB into your Robo Rio and hit the update button, it will install the web-based plugin and you will be able to see CAN devices. In fact, we have a screenshot of exactly what you're describing, where the CAN device tree is just plain missing. It's a clear, the, which tells me that you just need to install the plugin. In which case, you'll see CAN devices, and if you have uh, talons or victors or whatever plugged in, they'll populate with our devices. All right, cool. All right, so we're gonna do, I think, one more question. Uh, thank you everybody for submitting your questions. Uh, we're going to probably come up with a list and we'll probably uh, send it off to these guys to answer real quick. Um, and we'll see if they get, give us some answers the next day or two. And we'll put that up on, on Chief Delphi in the thread that we have for this show. Uh, but our last question today here coming up. Uh, so someone mentioned uh, test mode and they said they've played around with it. Uh, but do you guys spend significant time using it? Sell me on it. Oh. So Brad, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we, we put in a lot of effort uh, to, to make test mode really useful. Um, it's a little bit different. So it's, it's kind of slightly different in LabVIEW and in C++ and Java. So I'll talk about the C++ and Java stuff. And then maybe Greg can add something for, uh, for LabVIEW. But the idea is that if you, um, there's this kind of like holistic approach to using this stuff. So if you use all this stuff the way it's intended, you get, you get like a, a, um, a, the, the results are much better than kind of the sum of the parts. So the idea is that if you use like commands and subsystems, when you put the robot in test mode, you'll see all the subsystems on the dashboard in test mode, and you can manipulate the motors, you can see sensor values, you can um, do all that stuff, regardless of any robot code which you have written, uh, besides just defining the subsystems with the, with the speed controllers and sensors. So, uh, you know, at the end, so something that's kind of interesting is at the end of the first week, you know, like like by Saturday or something, you guys are going to know what motors and sensors you can have in your robot. You can start setting up all that stuff, that framework, and and as the as the subsystems get implemented, you can just go in test mode and you can start trying them. So you can just you know move the sliders around and see the motors move, and you can see the sensors operating, and you can set PID constants and all that stuff before you write any application code for your robot. And and so so. Um, we think the test mode is huge. I mean, it's just a great, great way of, uh, of, of testing stuff as you're writing your program. And the other really good use for it is since it's independent of your robot code, um, when you come in off of the field and the operator for your, or the driver for your robot says, oh, the elevator didn't go up, you know, there's something wrong. You can just pop it into test mode and you can try the elevator motor and see if it works. And you can see if the sensors are working without having to put in debug statements or anything like that into your program. So, so test mode is huge if you use it. Um, and, and you know, if you don't use it, you know, take advantage of it. Then it's not, it's it's nice, but not quite that organized. And uh, so, we encourage you to to use those features. 
Uh, if you use Robot Builder, by the way, it generates that stuff automatically, so you'll see it. Uh, all that stuff come out. Otherwise, you can just add a few lines of code to uh, make not you know handwritten code also come out in test mode. Greg, do you want to? Sure. Um, yeah, I encourage the students to use it. Uh, I think that uh, it's most beneficial when you're first starting out. And for example, you have a you have a, a gyro and you don't know which way is going to be positive and which way is negative, or you have some other sort of sensor and you just don't have your frame of reference. Uh, well, you can write some code, put it in print statements, deploy, or if you if you have that uh, object instantiated in your code, you just go to test mode. Uh, you wiggle the robot, wiggle the sensor, and look at the numbers change. Uh, same thing as Brad said, you can figure out which ways positive uh, positive numbers will how they'll drive a motor up or down on your actuator. Um, and uh, it's also useful for things like uh, camera configuration. Uh, things look funny, and this tells you how the camera object was instantiated. So it's just kind of a documentation tool of what the code did. Uh, and all you have to do uh, is uh, go to test mode, put, the, put it in test mode in the driver station, and uh, it'll show you everything that was instantiated in your code. Cool. Alrighty, well, everybody, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks one more time, uh, Omar, Peter, uh, Brad and Greg, thank you so much for helping. Thank you, Ruth, for coming on the, and do, hosting the show with me, of course, as always. Uh, and thank you to everybody watching today. We know we've gone about an hour and a half, but there's a lot of stuff we wanted to cover, so we wanted to make sure these guys had plenty of time to talk about all the things they need to go over. Um, so a couple things. I want to also thank uh, Abby at First. She's been uh, one of the pe person working with us at First Headquarters over the last season. Uh, we want to give her a big shout out and a big thanks for all the hard work she's done. And of course, the rest of the FRC uh, team there that's been helping us as well, like Jake uh, and everybody else. Um, that's going to close it out for Behind the Lines. If you want to learn more about FIRST or any of the technical topics we go over, this episode marks the 24th hour of Behind the Lines that we produced over the last four years. So if you've got a day uh, that you have to stay up, might as well just watch every episode of Behind the Lines. You can find that at youtube.com slash robosportsnetwork. This episode's going to be up on YouTube in just a few minutes after the show's over. So if you've got friends that didn't get to catch it or you want to scrub through some of the other parts, uh, again, you can watch that. And assuming everybody here uh, is good with it, I'm going to collect together all the questions that we didn't get answered. We'll put them into a Google Doc. We'll have everybody in the next day or two or whenever their schedule permits just go through and write a quick sentence about each one. And we'll post it back into the uh, in, into the into the, uh, the the Chief Delphi thread we've got. So everybody gets their question answered at least somewhat. Uh, on RoboSports Network news, one last thing. Uh, GameSense starts in just, it's gonna happen in just a few weeks. Stay tuned on Chief Delphi, follow us here on Twitch, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we'll get all that information and make sure that you stay up to date on the latest news when it comes to robots. But with that, good luck everybody. I hope you all uh, learned something today and I hope you have a great build season going forward. Uh, and have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye. Drivers behind the line.